okay, we have to talk after the session then to give you a, s a job back. Okay, welcome. Welcome to my session, Indie Web being social on the web. A little bit about me. In an Indie Web context, you would introduce yourself as saying or by saying, hi, my URL is realize.be. This sounds quite awkward if you do that in real life, person to person, of course, but in an indie web context, that's who I am. That's my identity. That's my domain. This is who I am on the interwebs. Um, of course, my name is still, like Mathieu said, Christoph. Um, I'm also known as Wendell on Drupal.org and uh, on Twitter, which I use a lot. So in this presentation, I'm going to try and give you an indie web 101, which is kind of hard because I'm also I've only been in the IndieWeb since I think around February and it's a lot of new concepts and specifications you have to read and figuring out how to implement them. So there's a lot of new concepts that you will learn today. It's about web mentions, micro formats, micro prep, micro sub, um, authenticating and then also something which is called the Fediverse and activity bot. So there's a lot of new stuff and at the end we'll do a live demo where nothing will go wrong hopefully. Um, but the demo, hopefully, uh, will show you how magically this thing can actually be. Um, and the goal of the talk is um, basically, hopefully, uh, at the end of the session, you have an idea how to create a setup where you can read from the web and interact with the web all from one place, being your own domain. Um, Basically, this talk describes, describes my setup, which I'm pretty um, happy with at the moment. Um, a little disclaimer in that sense, I maintain the Drupal Indie Web module, um, and I also maintain Indigenous for Android, uh, which is a MicroPub and MicroSub um, powered app. Um, MicroPub and MicroSub, we'll see that in uh, a couple of slides, what it actually is. Um, so what is this Indie Web anyway? I've been posting a lot about the Indie Web on Twitter, lately. Basically, I post them first on my site uh, and then I syndicate it to Twitter. Um, this is the indie web. Um, this is quite a lot. When I started reading uh, indieweb.org, where everything is documented, there's a lot of new concepts you have to learn. There's a lot of specifications you have to read, trying to figure out how to implement them. My mind basically exploded when I started reading. Um, and especially when you see the end goal, you're like, okay, this is what I want. This is what I really wanted for a lot of, a lot of, a lot, a long time, sorry. Um, but there's a lot you need to read. I think every single word that's on this slide is mentioned somewhere else. I'm not going to explain them all because a lot of the things happen under, under the hood. Um, but the end result is quite nice. Um, but first, how did we come to the end web? Um, if you look at the web in the beginning, the web in the beginning was fairly easy. The, the only way you could publish something was creating HTML pages and then putting up on a domain. And that's it. There was nothing in the beginning. There were web standards you had to create and promote. And that's about it, right? Um, and everyone, if you were interested in pushing your thoughts on the in internet, you would start a blog. And the way you would follow someone is through RSS feeds in a reader. That's basically what it was in the beginning. Um, very short history of the web, of course, but something happened in 2006. Um, a lot of ser new services started, and I think everyone in this room <laughs> probably uses one of those. I mean, uh, I'm on Twitter. I used to have Facebook at some point, but I quit it. Um, probably people use Instagram or whatever. There's a lot of new services out there. Um, which we call social media. But does anyone really like them? I mean, we like them for a couple of reasons. Um, but what do these services do, what your favorite framework cannot do? I mean, it's a lot about reading, 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 interacting stuff. Um, and there's a lot of benefits, of course. I mean, it's they're easy to use. They have clean user interfaces, and es especially the network effects are very handy. There's a lot of people on there you can reach in a couple of seconds if you like to. But behind them, there are corporations. And we all kind of know that the data that you post on there is not your data. It's their data. They misuse it sometimes. They probably sell it because they work for themselves. They have to make money somehow. A lot of these services are for free, which is kind of interesting if you think about it. You sign up somewhere for free, 
and they have to make money from it. So they probably just sell your data. That's how it goes. And what also happens, at <laughs> what I hear a lot, is people just saying at some point, like, Facebook has won. I mean, there's no use signing up s anywhere else because nobody else is on that different network. Everyone is on Facebook or on Twitter or on Instagram. Those are the big players. Um, there's probably a couple of more that I don't know of, but that's fine. Um, they use algorithms. Algorithms, you have no control over them. You have no clue how your timeline is built. And people don't don't really like them sometimes. Sometimes you know that an algorithm has changed your timeline instead of like being just chronologically, um, suddenly starts showing posts that are interesting or sponsored or whatever. Um, the interesting thing is I, I once wrote an algorithm for a social media site, which I'm not going to mention. Um <laughs> But it's interesting, I mean, from a technical point of view, writing an algorithm that manipulates basically people in reading is very interesting. You have a lot of parameters, then you put some machine learning to it, and then what you see is actually how people adapt easily. When something changes in an algorithm, people adapt so easily because they want to be visible on the social network. It's extremely fun, but it's also extremely, extremely scary if you look at it. Um, Besides the fact they're corporations, they're they can actually go bankrupt. I mean, there's a lot of side deaths. Um, all your data that has been on the network probably disappears. Uh, sometimes you have some time to pull out your data if you want to, but that doesn't happen uh, every single time. There have been a lot of them. I mean, I use Delicious at some point. I remember that. I use Google Reader a lot. Um, it was kind of sad. I was kind of sad when Google Reader shut down because that was my main reader um, for following people all over the internet who were still using RSS feeds, for instance. Um, there's one coming up in August 2019, Google Plus is dying. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people that use Google Plus. A lot of academics apparently use Google Plus because it has very good grouping features and stuff like that. Um, there are now a little bit in panic because they, there is no valid al alternative at this moment. Um, you can download all your data. I've looked at the data. It's kind of crap to figure out what to do with it. So, but that happens. Sites die. <laughs> that's, that's how life goes. You also have policy changes. Um, Flickr is a very interesting example in that sense. It was independent in the beginning. It was Baba Yahoo and is now Baba It's Mug Mug. And they recently announced if you do not have a paid account, you can only have a thousand pictures out there. I don't actually know what happens with thousand number 1001. I don't know whether it disappears or not. I haven't really checked what's going on there. But this, these things happen all the time. Um, Facebook, um, I don't know how it is in the, in the rest of Europe or uh, let's say in the United States, for, in, for, uh, for instance. Uh, if you serve to Facebook anonymously, usually you just get a pop-up saying like, you have to log in to see the rest of this post or whatever, things like that. But a lot of people post things on Facebook that I can't read because I don't have a Facebook account. Like, I'm constantly amazed that, especially nowadays, a lot of politicians, for instance, they just post their opinions on Facebook. And I'm like, okay, whatever. I mean, I can read them, which is kind of sad. It's silly. Um, they're shutting down public APIs. This is something typical with all these services. In the beginning, they start with giving you public API so as a developer you can create third-party applications, which is nice. Um, Facebook is a very good example, Instagram as well. They're shutting down public APIs. For instance, we had to tell our clients that if they won't be able anymore, when they post something on their website, they cannot publish it anymore through the API to Facebook. It, it sounds really silly when you have to tell a client that, and then it's like, okay, yeah, whatever. We can't do anything about it. It's just Facebook shutting down stuff. Um, my personal favorite um, is Slack dropping RSC support at some point. So it's very quiet in the Drupal contribute channels right now. I think the only plus side is <laughs> uh, you have Wim Leers all for yourself if you have a really tough question because he's still there. Um, I know that the Drupal community is trying to move around a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's quiet on the Drupal channels right now. I'm not going to rant too much about it, but I could if I wanted to. Um, so, 
what's the benefit of your domain? That's, that's why the indie web is gaining so much traction nowadays. You have control and freedom. You kind of know that your data is yours and you reach everyone who can go online. If you know the domain of someone, you can just go to it and you can read all the public stuff. Um, a nice analogy that came up last week in the indie web uh, RSC channels was a telephone analogy. If I have your number, I can contact you easily. It doesn't matter on which provider you are, for instance. This is a very uh, interesting analogy. If you're on the interweb if you're on with your domain, it doesn't ma matter which provider you use to connect to the internet, I can still read your stuff. If you're on a silo like Facebook or Twitter, I can't sometimes don't uh, not read your stuff. This is kind of annoying. So you avoid problems like content loss and identity loss. Of course, in terms for content loss, make sure you take backups, of course. Identity loss, make sure that you pay your uh, domain name every year or do it automatically. That's easy. You have no censorship or content theft or possibly a negative community. Um, so basically, that's why the indie web movement started. They wanted to go back to the roots of the web. And we're a loose collective. There's no corporation behind it. Uh, so there's no one telling us what to do or how to do. Or we just talk to each other and figure out how can we be social again through our own little domains. So the principles um, are quite easy, actually. So own your domain and data. Some people argue you should own your own server as well. Um, some people go as far that they put their own server in their sellers, which is fine. I don't do that. I have a rented server somewhere. Um, that's good enough for me, at least. Um, some of the other principles are quite obvious. It's something that we do within the Drupal community all the time. Use what you make, document it, and open source it. Um, what's also very interesting is the quite big focus on user experience and design. In that sense, if you look at the web movement at this point, we're at the first generation. A lot of people within the indie web movement are technical people who know how to write stuff and how to basically how we can connect with it. The idea is that we want to have everyone on the web. And well, not everyone is technically as good as the first generation. So if we build something, if we build applications, if we build servers or whatever, it should be very easy to install and to use so that basically everyone can use it. That's it. Um, we use a lot of um, web standards. We promote it. We, there's a lot of W3C involvement. involvement. Uh, what we'll see in the next slides, a lot of the specifications are actually recommendations already. So it's not something very dark or whatever. No, it's actually uh, uh, documented very specifically. And also, syndicate your content. This may sound weird, but we don't hate the social networks. If you post something on your website, it's totally fine to push it everywhere else because a lot of our friends and family are still on the social networks, so we still want to reach them somehow. Either they want or we want them to read our posts or we want to reply to them uh, instead of telling everyone, hey, okay, I'm just on my own little space here. So it's totally fine just to push out everything. But we know that at some point probably sites will die, so we <laughs> still have all the data that we pushed um, on our own little space. Um, what they also try to promote is something which is called HBC, Homebrew Website Clubs. Um, those are about weekly meetings in your local town. Um, I'd like to start one in Ghent at some point, so if someone is interested, uh, come talk to me uh, after the talk or tonight. And the idea is that you would hack on your own sites your own projects, and it doesn't have to be focused uh, on Drupal. I mean, it can be your, <laughs> it can be a WordPress uh, site, it can be your own single implementation, if you like. There's a lot of uh, actual plugins already available for every framework out there. So, just come over and uh, see if we can do some. So, the indie web building blocks. So, I had to slide in the beginning. The most important ones are basically mentioned here. So you have web mentioned microformats, authentication, micropub. Um, ActivityPub and WebSub is something that I'm not going to touch too much in this presentation because I don't have an actual implementation in the indie web module yet. Um, but those are the important ones. You can read all the specifications uh, on the link underneath if you like to. So 
the Drupal end event module it is currently split into eight sub-modules. You don't have to enable all of this functionality to be only in your app. If you just decide, like, I just want to receive web mentions, for instance, that's fine enough. My current setup does web mentions, microfront, microfront, and that's about it. Um, you can really choose. In the beginning, the Drupal Indie Web module did everything in one single module, and it became way too big. Um, that's why I did the split up, I think, like two weeks ago. Um, so it's uh, currently at beta four or five, actually. Uh, you can actually start using it um, because it's quite stable, actually. So let's start with web mention. Um, if you look it up on W3C, it's a recommendation. So that's quite good already. So what is a web mention, basically? Um, this is the best definition I could find. Um, basically, when you link to a website, you can send it a web mention. If that site supports web mention, that website may, and this is important, may, it doesn't have to, may display your post as a comment or a like or a different response. It depends on what you want to send to the other side. And basically, that's how you start a conversation from one side to another. Um, from a technical pers perspective, the not notification part, just pinging another site, is the same as a pingback. Pingback is something that has been uh, used uh, for several years already. The part where, where web mentions differ is that when a notification comes in, we start analyzing the other side to figure out, okay, what is this thing on the other side? Is it a comment? Is it a reply? Is it a bookmark? Is it a like? There's so many variants of response types. That's where web mentions differ, basically. Um, there's a couple of extensions. Um, Vouch is an anti-spam extension. There's also some mention and private men mention. I'm not going to touch that because they're really tricky to implement. Um, so this is the web mention model. So on the left, you have site A, which has an original post. And then you have site B, who <laughs> decides, like, this is an interesting post. I'm going to write a reply. So the way or what you do then is actually write a reply, publish it on site B, with potentially some context of the ori original post. So the context of the original post can be either just simply a URL, that's fine, or a little summary. Uh, and once it's published on site B, site B will send a web mention to site A. Site A will analyze what happened or what the actual thing is on site B, and then it can show it as a reply underneath site A. So you basically have the same thread on two sides, and then that's where the dance starts. If the reply comes in, I can reply on that reply, send a web mention back to site B, site B will analyze my reply and then put it underneath the thread there. So that's basically how it works in, in A and B. Um, an interesting thing here, you have Sol mention. Sol mention comes in when you have another one here on the left, when you have site C who reads the thread on site B which is like, okay, this is an interesting, I'm going to reply to site B, send a web mention to site B. Site B should then send also a web mention to site A. So it's, there's a lot of pinging going on all the time, basically. Uh, and that's what a sol mention is. Um, but web mention is basically between two sites. Um, discovery, how do you figure out that a, a website supports is quite easy. Um, you just have a link tag with the relation web mention and then uh, an endpoint. The endpoint can be on your own site. You can also use external services. Um, basically, any external service that I'll probably mention in this um, uh, talk is also open source. So you can host those services as well yourself if you want to. The Drupal Indie Web module has all the um, implementations built in as well. So you can basically choose what you like to do. Um, within web mentions, we also do a lot of syndication, like I said. You have two models, you have Fossey and Vsauce. Fossey basically means publish on your own site and then push it out everywhere on the internet where you like to. Um, and Vsauce is the other way around. Um, the example here is um, from Instagram. So ownyourgram.com is a service which if you give it access to your Instagram um, credentials or whatever, how you call it. If you post something on Instagram, Ownyogram 
will pull out the picture that you posted on Instagram and publish it back to your site so it's there as well. Uh, you probably have the picture on your phone, that's fine, but it is on your website at that moment as well. So those are the two models that happen. Uh, and what I use constantly is something called Bridgie. Bridgie is a service, again, it's open source, you can host it yourself. Um, and what it does, it allows you to automatically publish posts from your site to a lot of social networks out there. And what it also provides is a backfeed. So if I post something on Twitter, for instance, well, I first posted it on my site and then I syndicated to Twitter, Bridgie will follow my feed <coughs> and if someone likes or reposts or replies, Bridgie will send back a web mention to my site. I can analyze it and then I can just say, okay, I received a like from someone on Twitter or I received a like from someone on Instagram or on Facebook or whatever servers service you want to publish to. So Bridgie is a very handy service. You don't have to use it if you want to, but I use it because it's actually fun to have a conversation like this. Um, um, so this is on my website. This is like it's just an example of interactions that came back after I posted it initially on my website. So I just post a note and notes within the indie web context can be seen as a, a tweet. Bridgie has pushed it out to Twitter and when people start interacting on Twitter, it comes back to me as a web mention and I analyze it and then I show stuff. I also create automatically comments when they are on Twitter, but those comments does do not have to necessarily be from Twitter. Someone else can reply from his or her own website and it comes back naturally here back on my site. So I never lose complete context, which is fine. If Twitter dies at some point, I will still know what I did in 2018 in October and who liked it or who interacted with it in that sense. Um, there's a privacy thing here, of course. I show a lot of avatars which come from services which are public. I should probably still add a privacy policy that if you do not like this, then I could probably just stop showing your interactions on my side, of course. I'm probably going to st stop showing the avatars at some point. It was very nice in the beginning when I first set this up. It was like, okay, a web mention comes in. This is a like from Twitter. This is the actual face behind the reaction. It was nice to see, but yeah, maybe at some point I will remove it. So what does the Drupal Indie Web Module support? You can either rely on web mention IO, which is a hosted service, which does all of the very um, it, it handles um, incoming web mentions for you. It does analyzing on the websites. Or you can use the built-in web points in the uh, Drupal module. Uh, you can, of course, send web, web mentions to somewhere else. You can create comments, use Bridgie. Uh, and there's a lot of blocks to show uh, actual web mentions inside the right context on your website if you like to. There's a lot of other implementations. If you don't like Drupal and you want to use WordPress, that's fine. There's plugins that can receive uh, web mentions for WordPress. A lot of other frameworks have um, implementations for it already. So up to the next specification. Um, microformats and JSON formats too. Um, basically, microformats too is markup structured HTML and it's extremely simple to add. You just need to add classes to your markup. And then what happens if you, there's a lot of microformats parsers out there. So they just analyze HTML and through r some simple rules we can figure out what a page is. So a page can be a note, it can be a reply, it can be a like and it anal analyzes that by looking at your HTML and looking at the classes within. So why would you apply it? The number one reason is because when you receive a web mention we know some URL has pinged us uh, but we still don't know what it is exactly. So we have to analyze and figure out, okay, is this thing a, a like or a reply or a bookmark or whatever it, it can be. Um, you can also have microformats feeds. Um, just like you have RSS feeds or Atom feeds, microformat feeds basically is just a listing of posts which have microformats and within readers, uh, which will come to back, will which will come to a little bit later within Microsoft readers, because they are able to um, 
how do you say it in English, uh, to parse it really nicely, and microformats have more structure. You have more structured data uh, instead of RSS, for instance. Um, it's ideal for, like I said, Microsoft servers. Um, it's like I said, it's really easy. You just need to apply some classes to your content. So when a web mention comes in, I go to the other side. I'm going to analyze who sent it to me. And what you need to add, uh, basically, is an author H card. So it, it just basically starts with an element. And if you put it, if you put an H card class on it, the microphone parser, because it has rules of it, knows, OK, this is an author object. And then we start analyzing what's in it. So the canonical URL of this website is my website, of course. I can add some information if I like. You don't have to. If you only have the canonical URL, that's totally fine. If you don't want to expose more information about yourself, that's fine. Um, I also added an image so that if a web mention comes in, no, if I send a web mention to someone else and someone else analyzes my post, and finds my author object, it can show it um, my avatar on his or her side if they want to. You don't have to if you don't like that. So marking up, for instance, a note. A note is basically like a tweet. It's a very short plot. Um, you have an element which starts basically with h entry. Um, and then within, you have other properties like the publish date a note, you can have categories. There's a lot of classes that you can apply to so that when microformat parsers come in, you can get, they generate a nice object of what this thing actually is. Um, reply posts is kind of almost the same as a note, but the major difference here, of course, is that it contains a you in reply to class so that when something comes in and I see it's a reply, uh, if I, and, if I, and I find this class, sorry, then I know this is a reply to the actual URL, uh, which is listed right here. So microformats are very easy to apply to your markup. Um, you, can, you could prob probably also start using RDF, but they are really hard to implement, and basically adding classes is really easy. And you can use those classes as well just to design your website as well if you like to. So basically, by using microformats, we have post types. Post types can be note, article, reply, photo, like. Uh, and within Drupal, because we have content types, it's very easy just to create several content types which have their own destiny. Um, a note content type in my setup, for instance, just only has a body. Um, the article has uh, categories. Um, you ha I have a reply content type, which contains a link, which if I write a reply on my site, the link needs to have the URL to which I'm replying to, which is an external URL. So that's really easy to set up within Drupal, uh, luckily. Um, JF2 is a, um, so basically microformats 2 has a JSON representation. JF2 is more or less the same, but a simplified version. Um, not going to go too deep into this. This is used internally under the hood by Microsoft which we'll see a little bit later. So what does the Drupal Indie Web module do? There is a Microformats 2 module, which applies a lot of those classes to your content through preprocessed functions. There's a lot of formatters as well to add the right classes. Um, it also has a feeds module, um, which might, might sound weird because it's very easy um, to just use views and say, OK, I want a timeline of my latest 10 posts and then apply a view mode to it and that view mode is configured to render all the microformats. The reason I have a separate module is because views doesn't allow you to <coughs> mix entity types within a timeline or within a one query which is unless that has changed but um, what I do is I have one single timeline one single feed of content and comments at this point. And maybe at some point I want to expose more entities. I don't know yet. Um, but that's why you have feeds as feeds module within. Um, there's also the post context module. Uh, the post context module goes and fetches context from another URL. So you can display it on your own site. And the best way to show that is by basically going to a URL um, 
this is a reply I wrote on my side. Um, the title is kind of weird, of course, but basically it says I'm replying to uh, a post that Aaron uh, did on his website, and this this part is my reply to it. But because I'd like to know when I visit this post again later, or someone else visits this post, you have some context to what I'm actually replying. Um, sometimes when there are huge articles, I'm going to take a little summary so that I actually know what I'm replying to. And it's handy because like services die, but sites die as well. I mean, maybe Aaron within a year has something like, I'm done with this indie web, I'm going to stop posting stuff on my site, and he deletes everything. I still know within a couple of years that I once replied to Aaron, and this is what I replied to. Um, oops. No. Sorry. Um, so that's what the post context module does. Um, another specification. Um, Micropub, which also is recommended by uh, W3C, um, is a very easy one in, in that sense. It allows third-party clients to create or update or delete posts on your site. And it uses microformats to post stuff. And um, the reason why you would do this, it ties in great with readers. So we'll come to Microsoft in a couple of minutes. Micropub allows you or allows third-party clients, once authenticated, to post stuff from within the reader to your site. If that doesn't make sense, I hope it will make sense when I do the demo, because you have to see actually what, what it's capable of. Um, discovery, again, is again through a link tag using an internal um, endpoint within the Drupal module. There's a lot of clients and servers out there. Uh, if you don't like Drupal, you can always <laughs> use something else. I don't know. You can implement it yourself. Um, Clients and servers, I, like I said, I maintain the Android indigenous application, which is also a reader. So anything that happens on the internet, I usually read on my phone. And the things that I read on my phone come from everywhere. It can be RSS feeds, Atom feeds, can be microformats feeds. It can be, I also follow Twitter within indigenous through a, another third party service. And if I want to have interaction with everything in my reader, my reader also knows my micropub endpoint. When I do something within my reader, say a reply, it posts it to my website, and then my website is going to send a web mention to the right place. And then it's the other side that needs to handle it, of course. But that's basically how it works. Like a lot of services out there have applications where you read stuff and then you interact with them, with them right? But it's within the service. What within an indie web context, you follow everyone from everywhere. Um, and that's what we actually want to do. We only want one app to follow everything, I guess. Um, so the Drupal indie web module, what it does, it does post type discovery when a micro pub request comes in. And what basically happens is you need to map it onto Drupal content type. So when something comes in um, and after doing analysis on it, if you figure out that something is a node, you can map it to a node type, um, and then you decide where <coughs> the content goes. You can also upload images and configure tag fields if you'd like to. And within the Drupal Indie Map module, there's uh, a lot of post types that uh, can be configured. In case it doesn't exist, as a developer, you can still um, react to it and do something else with it. You can just store it if you'd like to. Uh, but Basically, those are the most used post types right now within the indie web movement uh, anyway. Um, which brings me to Microsub. So we have Micropub and Microsub. Uh, at this point, it's still a draft, but it's quite stable already. Um, and what we have within Microsub is basically a client and a server module, server model, sorry, um, where a server basically gathers feeds from everywhere on the internet. So those can be RSS feeds, Atom feeds, microformats feeds, or whatever feed you like. And then you have clients who connect to the Microsoft server, basically a reader. That's it. You read stuff from your own domain, or Microsoft servers um, can be an external service as well, if you'd like to. Uh, it doesn't have to be the internal in endpoint within the Drupal module. Um, there's some API actions, which I'm not going to touch here. Um, 
discovery again. Um, there's a Microsoft relation. Um, the endpoint, like I said, there is a Microsoft endpoint within the Drupal Indie Web module. So it gathers all the feeds and then stores it. And then I have my third party application which connects and then reads all the stuff. Um, but there is a very good uh, external one, which I think I mentioned here. Um, Aperture is a very good external service who does all the handling for you for reading. Basically, it's Google Reader, but it's free and open source, and you can host it yourself if you like to. Um, so this is how on Indigenous, uh, the spec within Microsoft basically describes that you need to have channels basically to categorize your feeds a little bit. Um, so you first get a set of channels, um, and then you have timeline. And this is where it all ties together a little bit. Um, I, you have a timeline, I follow people, and then you have social actions, like reply, like, um, we call it repost, we don't retweet, we repost, or bookmark. Um, if I would now reply here, the reply will go through Microsoft to my website, and that then a web mention will be sent again to Aaron to notify that I have posted something about him um, on my site. And you can also just create notes or articles really easily from the uh, Indigenous app. And like I, wa I also wanted to show something which is called Monocle. Um, Monocle is a hosted service. It's a desktop service. Um, it knows my Microsoft endpoint, so it basically I have a desktop reader as well if I wanted to. Uh, and as you see, I have, for instance, a notification channel. So when a web mention comes in, and it's actually on the notification channel, so Ruben, you liked my post on my site a couple of days ago. I just see it hit right here. I don't have to go to my Twitter client. It was stored in a Microsoft server. Um, there's a lot of other stuff that I follow. Like I said, I follow Twitter from within my mi Microsoft reader. And if I interact with Twitter, it's also through either Monocle or Indigenous. Um, so I only have one app. This is, it's very nice to interact through the web uh, on this in this way, like, like I said. Um, I also, for instance, follow people on the Fediverse. Um, which I'll come to in a couple of minutes, but the Fediverse is very interesting in that sense. They expose microformat feeds or atom feeds, but microformat feeds are more interesting in that sense. They have more content, so there's more structured data, so you can have nicer experience in a reader. Um, yeah, the best example probably I could give you is I also follow Dries, but Dries doesn't have a microformats enabled site, so what the only thing I see is. Um, his feed URL, which is kind of sad. I hope that Reese starts enabling web mentions and, and just adding an, an author card is good enough so I have more information here in my reader. So this is how it all ties together. You have web mentions, you have Micropub, you have Microsoft. And this is my current setup, how I read and interact with the web um, all through one single place, which is very handy. Um, so like I said, Drupal Indie Web Module, it contains a Microsoft module. Um, so the built-in endpoint is the server part. It, it I'm not planning to write another reader within Drupal. Uh, there's enough clients out there that can connect with it and, and read all the stuff. It also contains a media cache module so that when a post comes in, it contains reference references to images. Um, it can locally download them so that when my Microsoft server spits out to my reader, all the images are locally served from my domain as well. Uh, that's just faster. Um, and it relies on, I think, the image cache external module that you maintain. <laughs> I have some questions for you. <laughs> Sorry about it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm using the image cache external module to rely on that, and it's very handy. Um, now, an interesting thing I publish from third-party applications. I read from uh, from Microsoft, which is um, hosted on my domain. Um, you need authentication for this as well. Um, this is something which is called within the Indie Web Indie Auth. Um, it's also still in draft modus, but it builds on top of OAuth 2. So OAuth 2 is um, a specification which has proven that it's it's workable. It's quite secure. 
Um, it also can use rel me auth. I'm not going to go too deep in that because it's kind of tricky to set up, um, especially because the Drupal IndieWeb module right now contains uh, an internal uh, in the auth endpoint for either generating authorization codes or getting an access token so that third-party applications can use that token to talk to my site. Um, it's really easy. So the use case here is uh, third-party apps can use an access token so I can post things on my site or read from my site, basically. Um, discovery, again, is true. Uh, link tags, again, you don't have to use the internal endpoints. There are hosted services out there. Um, and the way that it works, I log in with my website name. Um, and for instance, this is Monocle. Um, when, when I submit or try to log in, it will redirect through the endpoint discovery to my site. And then I see the authorized form. It asks for some scopes. And then internally, when I go back and give it access, it will do a, a server post request to uh, access uh, to get the access token actually. So with this is also um, built in into the Indie Web module and it's very handy because the other, if you use an external service like Indie Auth, you have to rely on RHEL me auth, which is kind is really tricky to set up. Um, if you'd like to know about it, ask me after the session because I, I tried to explain it in the slides and it was really hard. Although it's kind of easy to set up. It's weird. It's very weird. Um, the Drupal Indie Web module also allows you to sign in into your site. So I don't I don't have it enabled because I don't have a use case for people to create accounts on my site. But people can um, sign in with their domain on your site, and then a Drupal account is created uh, underneath you, and it relies on the external auth module, um, and that's very handy. They don't have to create an account or manage passwords or whatever. Um, that's I think about it. Um, so there was a lot of things about the Indie Web. Things that we are experimenting right now a lot is um, contacting the Fediverse. So Mastodon is probably the, the, the best example and the best known example right now, and an alternative for Twitter. Um, the nice thing about Fediverse software is that you can install an instance uh, yourself on any domain and you can interact with any domain on the Fediverse. And what they use typically is either use ActivityPub or OS, OS status to communicate with each other. And for authentication, they use WebFinger. WebFinger is extremely tricky to set up and to implement. I haven't done that yet. I'm planning to build this into the Drupal module at some point. But um, at this point, I'm using an, an external service. So what if your site could communicate with the Fetty first? Um, like I said, you had Bridgie. Bridgie has also a subdomain called FedBridgie. It basically is a proxy around your domain and does all the heavy lifting of doing activity pop and web finger and authentication. Basically, the end goal, what it allows you to do is to talk with people on Mastodon on any instance right from your own domain. So I don't, I interact with people on um, Mastodon currently, also on PixelFed, and I don't have an account there. I just when I reply to someone, or if I do a post, once you have, let me start over. To get yourself discovered on the Fediverse, you have to interact once. And the way you interact with the Fediverse is either doing a reply or a like. Once that has happened, you are known within the Fediverse of that typical software. So Mastodon, I had to reply to someone on Mastodon so that every single instance on Mastodon suddenly knows my account, my site, which was extremely interesting to see. Um, like I said, Mastodon also uses microformats too. So I can follow everyone on Mastodon within my reader. I don't, I, I have a test account for Mastodon because we were testing some stuff, but I don't use that anymore. I follow people directly from Mastodon within my reader and I reply to them, currently using FedBridgie, um, which uses ActivityPub underneath. Um, and this is very nice. So if you are on Mastodon, I should probably just <laughs> show it like this. Um, if you would start searching for Swentel, you will get two results. Um, the first one is, is, is this account, which I 
uh, created just for testing stuff at first. But the second one, um, if you look at the handle, the handle is currently realize.de at realize.de. This is my site on the Fediverse. Um, and if I look at the summary here on the right, this is not an account that I created. This is something that the Fediverse, because it it uses ActivityPub and Webfinger, allows me to interact with it. And this is very nice. The canonical URL, for instance, for this post goes directly back to my website. So this is how it's very fun to interact on there, right? Um, module roadmap, I, I only have five minutes left. So let's go to a demo. Uh <laughs> Yeah, because th this slide is not really interesting. It's just about the ro module roadmap and whatever. Only the only thing I can say, it's relatively stable right now. <coughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's actually quite stable. I did a very breaking release two weeks ago, uh, going from module one module to eight submodules, and it was horrible for myself even to update because I've been using it so much already. But right now, I'm not going to do any breaking changes anymore, hopefully. So let's go to a demo. Um, <laughs> you never know what happens. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I've put on a little draft post on my indigenous client. You can't see this. This is kind of stupid, maybe. Um, I'm going to post a note, and <laughs> this note will go onto my notes view. So it isn't there yet. Uh, so let's just do that. And I'm going to. Uh, tell indigenous also to syndicate it to Twitter and uh, the Fediverse. So basically, <laughs> let's just start sending this. Um, okay, so the post has been posted to my website. Uh, basically, it's just telling me where you can find my s uh, telling you where you can find my slides. So under the hood, what happened right now is I also told it to publish it to Twitter or the Fediverse and um this is going to be done in the queue so you when you tell it to syndicate it somewhere uh, the handling happens in the queue you can either use drush or cron um drush runs every single minute so i'll just refresh a little bit <laughs> that's kind of the part of the demo i should probably trigger cron myself um let's see what time is it it's still in there it's still in the queue i'm sorry about that Maybe I should just trigger it myself. Um, let's see what the date is. <laughs> uh, date. Oh, come. Hmm? Is, is it on Twitter? Okay. So it's... Okay, it has been sent, right? So and, and people are apparently already liking or maybe they are mentioning it. So I've, I've posted this from my... Uh, from Indigenous. It went to my site and then I went to Twitter. Um, and it should also be on Mastodon, unless something went wrong there. Uh, this is the wrong one. Uh, so my post is now available on Mastodon as well. So people who then who now start reacting on Mastodon or on Twitter, I will get notified uh, from that at some point. So I see that people are <laughs> liking. <laughs> it, this is the fun part, right? People are liking stuff. Um <laughs> Uh, what happens now, so I use Bridgie. Um, so Bridgie, on my behalf, has uh, access to my Twitter feed, so it polls every half an hour. You could also just write this yourself if you'd like to. Twitter APIs are still probably the best APIs out there to do a lot, um, which probably makes Twitter basically the most horrible network to be on. I don't know. Um, but so let me go to my received web mentions on my site so there's nothing on there yet so the way that i can what i can do now is cheat a little um bridgie has an interface where i can basically just say okay start polling um <laughs> it does that basically every uh, half an hour or something like that but just for the purpose of this demo i just wanted to trigger it right now so bridgie is polling and hopefully <laughs> if all goes right I should start seeing incoming web mentions from Bridgie. So I'm I'm seeing incoming. Um, basically, at this point, <laughs> time is up. <laughs> Give me one more minute. Um, 
at this point, what mentions are, are being sent to me, but I still need to analyze them. I, I just got a notification from somewhere that tells me, hey, I'm pinging you, and now I, have I need to analyze what it exactly is. Um, there's more, uh, okay, so this, and I actually have my command ready to process them, I think. Uh, okay, so those web mentions need to be analyzed. Those are, uh, this is done by a drush command or can be done by cron as well. Okay, I need to copy. Uh, I'm on my server. Okay, so let's start analyzing all the stuff. This doesn't take too long, I think. Um, but basically what happens under the hood is now pinging the source URLs to figure out or to analyze the microformats so that I actually know what this web mention was. Was it a like or a reply or a retweet or whatever? Um, and let's see. Okay, it's done. So what I see now is there's a lot of likes, which is fine. <laughs> um, and if I now go to my reader, um, I should see a lot of new notifications coming in. So this is quite this is quite a nice way of having interaction, and I can al always do it from one single place. So there's there, there are some bugs here, <laughs> but that's totally fine. Uh, this is because I'm using the internal Microsoft and point eight. Uh, the Aperture version is much more stable uh, at this point. I'm still learning stuff, and and but in the end, I still see my notifications, which is basically what I wanted to show you. Whew. So my time is up. Um, no questions, yes. Uh, um, um, I don't know why this is so, okay. So thank you for listening. If you, <laughs> <laughs> if you have questions, I'd say come just talk to me um, after the session or I'll, I'll be at the social uh, thing tonight as well. Um, and I'd say come join me on the interweb because it's fun. <laughs> <laughs>